Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and Lord, and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text once again, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Please be seated. Now, it was in late February that WTOL reported on a Facebook post that had gone viral. This post was from Miranda, who is a mother of a couple kids who, like most kids, struggled to keep the house clean. And so she wanted to challenge her kids and show them the importance of helping and everyone helping to clean up. So she took a piece of paper, a piece of trash, and taped a $5 bill to the back of it and placed it hidden, but in plain sight, in the bathroom. And the first kid to pick up that trash and throw it away would discover the $5 and it was theirs. So then Miranda made this Facebook post after 48 hours when that piece of trash with the $5 bill was still laying on the bathroom floor for all to see, and yet none of them could see it. Now, every kid that I know of would love to have $5. Just think of another McDonald's Happy Meal or a, a toys or whatever you can buy with that $5. And to be honest, I don't know too many adults that would turn away a free $5 bill if you find it laying in the middle of the ground. But none in her family could see it, at least for the 48 hours before the post. And let's be honest, many of us, we can't see, or at least we pretend not to see what is right before us as well. And so in our text today from 2 Corinthians 5, Paul is calling our attention to look a little closer, to open our eyes. And he challenges us to see things a little bit differently. As he challenges us to look to Jesus and to see things through Jesus. And so as Paul is writing to the people of Corinth, he's writing to a people he already has a pretty long history with. We know from Scripture uh, that he wrote two letters to the Corinthians, and many scholars believe he wrote at least two others that we don't have copies of now. And we know that he also made multiple visits to the people of Corinth, and not all of them were easy. Going back to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, Paul says this, For I made up my mind not to make another painful visit to you. So he's got a long history, and it's not even a comfortable history. And then, if you jump back into 1 Corinthians, that letter was written to a people that were in conflict and division at that time. The Corinth, the, Corinth, the area of Corinth at the time was a very cosmopolitan area, very diverse, uh, many uh, different uh, ethnic backgrounds and social constructs and religious understandings. It was a very, again, cosmopolitan area, and, and because of that, there was great division and conflict that was found. And so Paul had every reason to look down upon the people of Corinth and at least to become frustrated with them. And he kind of writes that way, especially in 1 Corinthians, as he's chastising them for what they have done. They had great difficulty with this city, and so by the time we get to 2 Corinthians, and in chapter 5, Paul is not writing in a place of condemnation, but instead he is speaking in the positive, trying to help them overcome the challenges they face. And so he encourages them to focus on Jesus. Look at Jesus and see the impact that he has on your life, on your words, on your actions even now. And so right before he, send, he gives us our text in verse 16, uh, you remember what comes before verse 16, right? Verse 15. Verse 15 says this, Jesus died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake uh, died and was raised. So Paul begins his argument for today's text focusing back on Jesus in his death and resurrection. Since Jesus died and because he was raised, your life as Corinthians, and let's be honest, our lives as well, they're different with a different focus as now our words, our actions, everything reflects a new reality. 
And so now, if you've got your Bibles open or you've looked at the backside of the announcements bulletin, now it starts to make sense why he begins in 16 by saying, from now on, therefore, now on referring back to Jesus' death and resurrection, ever since that point, therefore, verse 16, we regard no one according to the flesh. And it's easy to see people according to the flesh. But Paul is encouraging them to see things differently, to see according to this new creation. Paul has every right to see them according to the flesh. We've already referenced how he spoke to them about the conflict that they have. He's made a painful visit to them. He has every reason to to see them according to the flesh, and, and yet he's writing about something different. And Paul knows what it's like to see according to the flesh. He once saw Jesus according to the flesh. And he acknowledges that. He couldn't see the divinity of Jesus, but instead saw him as just another rabbi, even a blasphemer, who was going against what the Pharisees were once teaching. Remember, Paul, who was Saul, was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was the one who would persecute the church and anyone who turned to Jesus. He knew Jesus. He just didn't believe in Jesus at that time. He only saw him, but couldn't see him beyond what the flesh could reveal. And that's easy to do. Because the flesh is all that we see around us. Miranda, she takes that piece of trash and she put the five dollar bill underneath it and all the kids could see was a piece of trash and they ignored it in fact she said at one point in that first 48 hours one of the kids had kicked it and moved it and yet it didn't flip over and they still couldn't find the greatness that was waiting for them and we too we easily can see the trash that is around us and i'm not just talking about trashy tv and trashy news and trashy gossip but we smell the trash and we see the dirt and and the grime of it all around us and we often have to hold our nose because of what we see. The trashy people, the trashy decisions they make, the trashy actions and how they affect our life every day. It's so much easier to just walk away or to avoid it, to hold our nose and to send them on their own way as outcasts. It's not worth following them. It's below us to be around them. And you know people like that, that you, you look at them and you just shake your head. They're the ones that have the bad attitudes that drag you down on Monday. They're the ones on Tuesday through Friday you just try to avoid as best you can because at least the weekend you're free from them. You know the people. They take too much of our time by telling too long of stories. They're easier to label as trash, and you just want to throw them out in the dumpster and be done with them. See, that's the nature of sin that creates divisions in our lives, that allows us, empowers us to look down upon others and see them according to the flesh. But it's not always that way, is it? Because, yeah, there are trashy people we may want to avoid, but other times... We want to dive right in. We want to see the trash and get into the trash like a raccoon who finds an open dumpster and sees a great big buffet that is waiting for him. See, sometimes we like to get dirty because that's when we're feeling a little more rebellious and a little more exciting. That's when we feel the freedom that is waiting for us and you can't tell me what to do. I'm going to stick it to the man and go my own way. And yet, you know reality that every time you start playing in the trash, you come out dirty and stinky and the sin is before us once again. It's easy to ignore the dangers of sin and to see the temptation before us and we don't realize it until it's too late and we're covered in the filth and the grime once more. See, trash is all around us. And we know snobby people who will turn up their nose in disgust at others and the actions that they have. Or we all know the careless people who dive right in and get stuck in that trash. And let's be honest, we know ourselves and that we are on both sides of that at the same time. It's easy to see according to the trash and according to the flesh. But what's Paul say? From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. For, as he continues into verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. 
We may see people according to the flesh, but there is something greater that is hidden, that God is at work as he is renewing this creation. And if anyone is in Christ, as Paul says, he is that new creation. That word anyone, that's the powerful word. Paul isn't restricting this new creation to just a certain group of people, but he's saying anyone is a part of this new creation. And those anyone's, they're everywhere. Those anyone's are in your family, and they're amongst your friends, and they're throughout this community. They are the ones who may have led the trashiest lives in the past or stuck in the trash even right now. But anyone in Christ is a new creation. And that new creation is powerful for us as well. That word new creation, it gives us the, the opportunity to just imagine as it plays with our imagination. New creation, now we're talking about a place where there is no tear, no more pain, no more mourning, no sickness, no death, no addiction, no abuse, no loneliness, no depression, no more sorrow or any pain to be found. New creation. It plays with our imagination. It plays with our frame of reference. In this new creation where we no longer see according to the flesh, we don't see others by uh, position or influence or resume or history or any of that. We don't see according to the flesh because in Christ, anyone and everyone is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And then you take that word, phrase, those two words, has come. Now we're talking about that past event at the cross and through the resurrection, that new creation came, but it has come, which means it continues to come every day and every moment, even to those who are in the midst of the trash right now. The new creation is here, even if we can't see it right now. And it may sound impossible or odd or just a, a fairy tale, but as we look at Jesus and as we fix our eyes upon him, we see that God did not need to be reconciled to us. It's not that God had somehow gone away from us or went into hiding, but in sin, we were the ones separated from God. Sin separated us from him so that now we were the ones who needed to be reconciled. And that's the power of Jesus. And that's what we fix our eyes on this season of Lent. For all of this, back to our theme verse, verse 18, all of this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. See, Jesus is at the center. And he is the one who brings us back to God. He is the one that brings us together. And the church, we're not peddlers who are trying to push Jesus we're not salesmen who are trying to convince someone to buy Jesus. We are ones who have received the new creation, been impacted by this new creation, and now we're sent as ambassadors proclaiming what we have perceived and what is proceeding to us and through us. We have a new way of seeing the world, not according to the flesh and the sin that is found within, but now we look according to Jesus and his reconciliation and his new creation. And so in Lent, we fix our eyes upon Jesus. As we move closer and closer to the cross and see him moving closer to the cross. As we said, Paul once saw Jesus according to the flesh. And he persecuted his followers. But God reconciled Paul to himself and called him to faith and sent him as an ambassador of the new creation. And in the season of Lent, Paul is calling to you as well. And he is inviting you to see Jesus as the great reconciler who is restoring this creation. And so it leads us to the question, who in your life needs that reconciliation? Who are you actively avoiding or passively forgetting? Who needs to hear words of forgiveness? Who is longing for a word of comfort from you, whether it's because of a history with you or from somewhere else? And whoever it is, Jesus is already there, and he's already working behind the scenes in ways that we sometimes can't see. He is already going to the trash of the past and revealing more than just a $5 bill. Jesus is already there revealing a new creation. 
Now, as Miranda hid the $5 bill, uh, the kids couldn't find it for 48 hours. And finally, the following Wednesday, so we're talking Saturday to Wednesday, a good half a week, one of her children uh, goes to take a bath, throws the clothes on the floor, and after the bath, picks up the clothes, and in doing so, touches the paper, it flips over, and she finds the $5. Kid was excited. So she takes the $5 off the piece of trash, puts the trash on the counter, and runs off. Mom then had to have another conversation with all the kids, revealing what happened and telling them they need to play a part in cleaning up what is around. See, every so often, we get glimpses of God's greatness. We see Jesus shining through. And every so often, we get those moments where we say, someone greater was behind this. And we know that God was present. And in the season of Lent, our prayer is that God would still come amongst us in Jesus as we fix our eyes upon him who is the great reconciler of all the divisions, of all the trash, of all the sin of the flesh that is still here. And we're still going to run into the trash. We're still going to be tempted by the trash. That's a reality of this side of creation. But every time we see it in ourselves or in others, we know God is at work, reconciling, restoring. And you have received power to be reconciled and to be that reconciler as well as you are a part of the new creation. Amen. And now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds together with Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. At this time we gather our tithes and offerings. As we respond.